Hey guys, welcome back to the shop for this build video. First Bowie knife build in Texas at the new shop. Thanks for being here. This is the first of a multi-part series and then I've considered re-editing it into one full video. We'll see how that goes. So as you can see, I'm marking off some sawmill blade to cut up into pieces and I'll be using that for the pattern welded steel or Damascus steel for the blade and pairing that with 1095 high carbon steel. 1095 and 15 and 20, which is what the sawmill blade is, is my favorite uh, combination so far for Damascus steel. There's, there's other good ones too, but I've gotten some really good results with this. Currently the best way I have to cut this up is with the cutoff wheel on the angle grinder and that particular cutoff wheel I believe is about 40, 43, 45 thousandths, I'm not sure, but right around there. And of course the thicker your cutoff wheel gets, the less effective it seems to be or less effective it is, more more surface resistance. A plasma cutter would, would be pretty nice too, but this works fine. So that's something to take into consideration whenever you're using reclaimed steel even if the steel is free or much less expensive than buying new steel, you have to take into consideration the time and effort required to prep the steel uh, for your given project before you can actually use it. Now here I kind of goofed up talking about steel prep with reclaimed steel. I was thinking I wanted to get every last usable bit of steel off of this width which comes out to about seven inches of usable steel I think somewhere in there but that left me with two stacks of two inch wide pieces and a couple stacks of about an inch and a quarter to inch and a half so not ideal but I'll just use the narrower pieces on something else so not a total loss so there's the first bit of prep and now it's time to cut the 1095 high carbon steel into pieces as well. This steel came from New Jersey Steel Baron and it's sold as two inches wide. It's actually a little bit wider than two inches. So that's something to think about when you're prepping your steel. If it's important to you to have exactly the same width, which is nice when you're stacking a billet. Now comes the fun part, grinding off every single surface that needs to be forge welded together. Now here I want to share something that I, I, I've noticed. I'm not certain about yet. I have to do some further investigation. But I'm using a 40 grit uh, ceramic belt. The brand is 3M and I can't remember the name of the belt. It's, it's one of their lines, one of 3M's lines. I love the belt. It works really great. But I have noticed in, I noticed here that it seems there are some small pieces of uh, grit getting stuck into the surface of the steel, or the soft steel I should say, in this case the 1095, and that would not be good obviously. So um, it didn't, it hasn't happened with the sawmill blade steel, which obviously is harder, it's hardened and tempered for use. But the soft 1095 steel that comes in a annealed or spheridized actually, a spheridized state, it's kind of like, it, I think it was catching some pieces of grit. So as you can see, there are perpendicular grind marks. I went back and cleaned off every one where I saw any potential little pock marks or pockets where it, a, a, a piece of grit looked like it could have been stuck in there. I don't know. I might have to go back to a finer grit or a different belt for specifically for uh, Damascus prep, but that's something to watch out for. Getting the billet as squared up as possible. So I'm going to be doing a zero atmosphere forge weld on this billet, accomplished with a covering of sheet steel. So you might be wondering why am I spraying it down with WD-40? Well, that's a very good question. The reason I did that was because I was at a stopping point. I had to quit for the day right before I welded the 
steel, the mild steel jacket onto the billet. And I did not want any kind of moisture or humidity or anything to affect the clean uh, surfaces of the steel that I had just cleaned. So I sprayed it down in WD-40 to make sure there wasn't any danger of corrosion of any kind. And you can see the WD-40 is burning off as I weld here. That might freak some people out, but really was not an issue. And any residual WD-40 left inside between the layers will burn off as the billet heats up. And this steel jacket is not airtight. For one thing, the rod that I'm using is is a rod that produces a porous weld. And so throughout welding this whole billet together, there's, I'm sure there's multiple places that are not airtight. Now it's close enough to airtight to keep out oxygen, but when you're actually doing canister Damascus, like with the powder steel and stuff like that, you typically want to drill a tiny hole uh, somewhere in the canister to allow for the expansion of gases that just happen when you heat something up. So the point is some WD-40 burning off is not going to be an issue here. Now there's probably better ways to do this as far as wrapping this in a steel jacket. It might be simpler to cut two pieces and bend them to a U shape, which I've done that before as well. I thought I would try wrapping it up and putting one weld seam. In any event, this is a great way to get super clean, easy, no fuss, no muss. Damascus steel because you can stick it in your forge, let it heat up. You don't have to worry about oxidization. You don't have to worry about messy flux. It's just, it's just nice. And of course you can forge well with something like just WD-40 in the right forge atmosphere and stuff, but even that you want to be careful. You don't leave it in too long, things like that. With, with the canister around this or the jacket around, around the billet, it's just worry-free. You just stick it in there, heat it up, pull it out, squish it. I don't do this on every Damascus billet I make. I just decided to this time. It's really a trade-off. You either spend extra time sealing it up in a steel jacket or you spend extra time, you know, fluxing and being real careful about all of that. It's just a trade-off. There's no quick and easy way to do this, boys and girls. <laughs> so, heating it up here. First forge weld pass on the press, and you can see that scale coming off of there. Like I said, with the jacket, I don't worry about how long it's in the forge compared comparatively to when I'm not using a steel jacket. Obviously, you don't want to let it sit there in the forge forever, and that'll not do, not do any favors with your steel. So obviously I don't do that, but it's just a lot more worry-free. Easier in that regard, less easy in prep time. You can see that outsides of the jacket on the sides obviously are not welded to the billet, which is exactly what we want. Now it's time to take that off before we go any further. Once again, this is another time-consuming aspect of doing it this way. Again, it's a trade-off, so you really just have to decide what is more important for you. And like I say, I've, I've done both. I, I think I've probably done this less, but look at that. It's just clean. So here I'm grinding off the outside corners of the billet where that welding bead was to secure that steel jacket to the outside of the billet stack. 
because I don't want any mild steel on the billet going forward, obviously. So grinding that all off, you might be asking yourself, is it really worth it to do it this way? Well, like I say, it depends. It's, it is a trade-off, but we've got a nice clean billet, forge welded up, no worries about any kind of issues in there. So it's time to draw this thing out so we can get another stack on it. I believe this billet was a 29 layer when I started. I do know that the final layers on the billet are 348 minus the ones that come off during grinding and cleaning, which is just part of the process. Using the round dies, of course, because that's far more efficient in drawing the steel out. I'm trying to keep it square as I go. It's a little wonky right there, as you can see, but we'll get it squared back up here on the flat, flat dies here. Just look at that steel squish. Of course you want to be doing this close to welding heat. Keep that scale off of there. Okay, so we have it down to the dimension that we need to Chop it up, restack it, start getting our layer count. Tell you what, that chop saw did not want to cut that. I think actually did semi okay on this one on the on the second no on the third stack. It it didn't like it. It was a thicker thicker piece, and I only had three pieces. But uh, yeah, that was time consuming getting it through there. So now that the billet has cool down enough to where putting it in water is not going to harm it. Put those pieces in there, get them nice and cool so we can go back to the grinder and clean up all the steel surfaces, or all the surfaces. It's all steel, what am I saying? Clean up those surfaces and reforge weld it, so. Now you can see where I've marked out, and that's the outsides. I pick the, the worst surfaces that maybe have some little bit deeper um, spots or, or pock marks or something from forge scale during the forging process. And I'll leave those on the outside instead of trying to grind that flat. So I'll pick the worst two possible and put them on the outside. They're all, I mean, they're all pretty decent, but just cuts down on the amount of grinding necessary and the, and the material loss too. So once again, I'm gonna do a zero atmosphere and I'm gonna accomplish that by running a welding bead all around the perimeter of each of those seams. So three total all the way around there. And again, it's time consuming. It takes a little more time, but it's just worry-free. More WD-40 you say, why? Why are you doing this? Well, because the first time I did it because I, I wanted to make sure there was no corrosion, possibility of corrosion overnight. And then I thought, hey, let's try it a second time. I wonder if there's any kind of noticeable benefit or anything like that to doing that. Um, not that I can tell so far, but I said, what the heck, and did it anyway. So you can see I'm knocking all the all the scale or the flux off of that welding bead. I don't want any of that anywhere near my forging press dies because it's it would uh, ruin them. And there's some uh, grinding dust on the floor. Imagine that. All right, so this is second forge weld. Let's get it done here. Throw it in the forge, heat it up. I will say I'm pretty happy with this forge 
this little single burner, it is relatively, or I shouldn't say relatively, compared to most other forges I've used, it's super efficient. It's really, it's really great on the fuel. And it, it forge welds great, works well. There are a couple issues with it as far as the bricks falling apart, and that's just a that's just a matter of creating a, a better outside covering for the whole thing. But overall, it's a great little forge. Um, yeah, really no no complaints that I didn't expect. Get that thing drawn out. So this is our final forge weld. And there's our bar of Damascus after uh, a couple days in between. All right, let's forge this blade. All right, we're just doing it, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is forge the tip on it, roughly. Keep that in cooled down. You can see that tip starting to form there. And the thickness of the billet is still uh, at least half an inch right here. Right around half an inch, I believe. Forge that tip in there a little bit. As of yet, there is no pattern other than a random pattern that you might see or that you would see. There's no, we haven't given the steel a pattern yet, but we've got over 300 layers to work with here. So I'm excited about what it's going to look like. One of the that's kind of my favorite, generally my favorite uh, layer count is between two and 300 layers for most things. seems like much beyond that, it gets so fine that it's kind of hard to distinguish the pattern and, and you can go lower than that and it still makes a nice pattern, but I, I really like the 300 layer sort of range for most things. And I feel like it's also, it also makes a good, uh, what, what am I trying to say? It mixes the two steels, I think, sufficiently enough to kind of really use the two steel characteristics uh, together well, and in this case, the 1095 and the 15 and 20, which have differing carbon contents. I mean, you can imagine if you did a, a super low layer, the blade would still work just fine and be great, but perhaps you wouldn't have the homogene homogeneous characteristics that you could, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just speculating here. So we're doing a ladder pattern on the blade here, and you can see this is how we're doing it, grinding out some grooves, leaving a thickness down the center of the blade and squishing it out. So basically what we're doing is revealing the sides of those grooves in a 2D scape. Is that, is that the proper use of the word? I don't know. Now, obviously we're gaining length and some width during this process. And so that's important to take into consideration. I want about a nine and a half, 10 inch blade here. And so if I were to do grooves all the way up nine inches, I'd end up with a longer blade than I anticipated. And I don't need to put a pattern on the tang because you're not gonna see it. So I'm, I'm rather fond of doing Doing the pattern this way, I've only done it this way two or three times so far, but it's I think it's generally superior to trying to put a pattern on a whole piece of bar and then making a knife out of it. And I actually saw that, saw Jason Knight do it in one of his videos and I said, aha, why didn't I think of that? But I didn't, so I just used his idea. He probably didn't think of it either. Somebody did though. Chopping it off for the tang hidden tang on this. I debated back and forth. Do I want to do a hidden tang? Do I not want to do a hidden, hidden tang? Originally, I, I wanted to do a full tang, but as tends to happen, I looked at that bar of Damascus steel and thought about the, you know, inch and a half that I could save if I did a, if I did a hidden tang. <laughs> and so I, I had to do a hidden tang because that stuff is like gold, man. <clears throat> spend that much time smashing pieces of steel together and forging it out, you're, you get a little stingy with it. Well, not stingy, but conservative. I don't know. Forging the tang out here. The other thing is too, you know, I haven't done enough hidden tang blades with the guard and all that kind of stuff. So 
it's time to do one anyway. It'll turn out, it's gonna turn out really cool, I think. Now I've left about, oh, that blade's at least a quarter inch thick right now. And that's with the forge scale on it and, and the rough texture and stuff. So that's gonna give us enough to grind that off and grind it clean. And, and, then, and then also uh, grind the bevel in, of course, but not take all our pattern out. So you have to keep that in consideration. You have to forge, forge it down thin enough to where you're not gonna grind through your pattern down to the finished blade thickness, but you can't forge it so thin that you, you don't have anything to clean it up with. Does that make sense? It's all about a balance there. So I did a, a rough initial normalizing cycle on the blade. I'll obviously come back and do a full normalizing and thermo cycles before it's finished, but there's the, there's the roughed out blade. Oh, what? That's the end of the video? Oh man, I was, I was all getting into it and that's the end of the video. I guess that just means we're gonna have to come back for part two, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching guys, we'll see you on the next video.